Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well you can tell from the cluttered bench, we're busy in the middle of this project. Had a viewer send me another MusicShare X7 and it's got the same problem that all of these develop and that is that these switches or something in the meter circuit quits working and it no longer reads the bias of the tubes. So we're going to address that issue which should be a permanent solution which will be an interesting change and then I'm kind of going to go over like some of the little tricks that I've learned working on these things and what I've learned works, what doesn't work that sort of thing. So this first segment we're going to be replacing the main power caps. We're going to be removing the headphone jack wiring and direct wiring the speaker output jacks to the output transformers and going over that part of this upgrade. And actually this segment is kind of an optional thing. But hey we'll get into that at the end of the video. Let's get busy working on this amp. Okay, so we're going to go back inside another one of these MusaShare X7s. And hopefully this is the last one of these I'm going to be working on. So, first thing we're going to do is replace these two big caps here. These are 450 volts rated, and the amp goes past 450 volts before the tubes start drawing current. And so... Well, it doesn't seem to kill these caps to temporarily go over voltage. It's just not really a good idea. So we're going with some 500 volt ones that are also 105C temperature rated instead of 85C. So we're going to update. Got two of these big guys. And these are the same 35 millimeter diameter. So they fit in these little clamps. They're actually a little shorter than the ones that are in here so should be fairly easy to replace you just unsolder all these wires and then you get the circuit board with some wicking stuff solder wick you can get the solder off enough to get these little boards off and put the board back on the new caps and then solder all these wires back on and i usually do them one at a time and then put this little film cap and resistor back on so that's a fairly cut and dry thing the other thing that i do is I replace these big 10 ohm cathode resistors that are used as a shunt for the meter to measure how much current is going through the tube with these little half watt guys. And you're probably looking at those going, oh my god, there's no way that's going to control the current of a KT88 tube. We have to remember these are only 10 ohms. And so They've got less than 0.02 watts of dissipation going across them at the 40 milliamps. These tubes are biased at, and even if you bias them hotter, you're not going to get anywhere near, I mean, you might get them up to 0.04. But the good thing is, if you use a half watt resistor, if the tube red plates and starts going into thermal nuclear meltdown, once it goes past about 200 milliamps, it'll just blow that resistor instead of taking out the output transformer or some other bad thing. So you really don't want high watt rating resistors on the cathodes of these tubes. Like I said, if you put a small one in there, then it'll act like a fuse if there's ever a failure. So the other thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be placing these coupling caps with some these high quality Mundorf aluminum oil guys. There's four of those. And then there's these two little guys that, in my honest opinion, don't have as much impact on the sonic signature. When I've replaced those in the past, I didn't really notice much of a change. And so you could leave those alone, or you could go ahead and replace them, not necessarily with some super high-end stuff. The other thing that this is the main issue that this amp has 
are these rotary switches that switch between the V meter and the bias adjusting function. And I don't think the switches themselves are the problem. I think the problem is they never get used. And so the contacts get oxidized and the switch quits working. I did replace them with some what I thought were going to be higher quality ones, but I couldn't find any direct replacements that had like silver contacts. And unfortunately, on the one that I rebuilt and I replaced that switch on, six months later, those failed. And I think really what needs to happen is, you know, either find some gold plated contact kind of switches, either that or put some other different kind of switches, you know, or switching system, or just every time you turn the amp on, just rotate that switch back and forth to keep the contacts clean. But in lieu of that, we are going to put some little bias checking points. We're going to put four of these little guys, and I haven't decided exactly where I'm going to put these yet. I might put them on the top of the amp right next to the adjusting screws. I may put them in the side, whichever place makes the most sense. There is this dual layer kind of board and I need to like make sure that this stuff isn't made out of some crazy hard to drill metal or what I call undrillium. I've run across stainless steel on some of these like those Bowie range amps. The metal they make those out of with the chrome plating is just you can't it's almost impossible you'll burn up 20 drill bits trying to drill through it and so i'm going to see how easy this metal is to drill and try to figure out where i'm going to put these but i'm going to put four of these little measuring points so if the meters fail at some point in the future the amp's not unusable you can just use a multimeter and measure the voltage and adjust the potentiometer to get you to the milliamp rating that equals the millivolts that you want to see by measuring the voltage drop across these resistors because that's what the meter is doing. And the last thing we're going to be doing, we're going to be updating the bias potentiometers with these military spec units that are a longer shaft version. So this sticks up to the top of the chassis just a little bit and it makes it way easier to adjust the bias because then you're not fishing for the screwdriver slot down in some hole. It's sitting up above the chassis where it's easy to put a screwdriver on and adjust. And like I said, these are military spec units that are much higher quality and these aren't going to fail like the ones that come in these amps tend to do. So that's the main upgrades we're going to be doing to this thing. So I'm going to go ahead and do these capacitors and these resistors because that's pretty cut and dry. I may go ahead and swap these caps in too, show you what that looks like, and then I'll do a more detailed kind of step-by-step -step video on doing these potentiometers. Okay, so let me go over what we've done up to this point. Got the two new caps put in, and they're using this as the main star ground point which is the negative side of the first cap so you have the power from this bridge rectifier it comes across here to the positive then it goes through this black wire this is a new choke we replaced this 180 milliamp 3 henry choke with this Hammond 250 milliamp 3 Henry choke. In case you want to experiment with biasing the tubes hotter than what MusaShare has, there's some headroom in the choke here to be able to do that. So, got a little bit bigger choke. It's a 194G. It's the same one we put in the Wilsonton R8 when we did the upgrade on it. This is optional. To me, these aren't. I would go ahead and replace these, like I explained earlier, with some 500 volt caps. But again, if you want to wait to see if they fail, this unit's been in service for several years. So like I was saying, this is the main star ground point, but then they have a wire that comes over here to 
this negative that's also got a bunch of grounds connected to it. And it's really hard to do this super neat because you've got five, six wires connected to each terminal that's just a flat terminal on this PC board that's on the end of the cap. So you just, it's just kind of just a huge big solder mound with all the wires stuck into it. This is a bleeder resistor. Then we have this film cap across here. Then there's another resistor up under here that goes down to this board. So make sure you hook that back up. Now, one thing we did in this amp is we got rid of the headphone wiring. The owner said he never used the headphone jack, and there's a bunch of ground wiring for the speaker jacks that run across the amp up here to the headphone jack and then back. And I think it's sonically better to just hook the ground or the negative speaker terminal straight to the output transformer. So when you pull this headphone jack wiring out, you'll clip the big fat wire that's not going to the output transformer. It's pretty obvious. It goes up there to the headphone jack. You cut that big wire. You cut this big wire on this positive terminal and then you cut these ground wires that used to go up here to the front cut them to a length that you can solder them to this ground or the negative terminal of the output transformer and then you leave this ground wire that goes from the output transformer up to this negative terminal on this cap because that's the return path for the global negative feedback so that kind of wraps up this first little wiring step. So we've replaced these two caps. We replaced the choke. We've removed the headphone wiring and wired the negative terminal of the speaker straight to the output transformer. And then there's one other thing that you have to do. And I'm going to zoom in for this one. This switch right here, which is the preamp selector switch that controls the relay over at the volume control to determine if you're going to bypass the volume control or not. It had this ground wire connected up here to the headphone jack ground, which we're not using anymore. So to keep this functional, solder a wire from this terminal on the switch and Connect it over here to this ground bus. You can see this little black wire here. And that keeps this switch functional for its use as the preamp switch. And one of the things that I've talked about that I strongly believe in is when you're doing this kind of a modification to an amplifier, you're upgrading parts and stuff, don't do the whole amp in one sitting and then plug it back in and test it. You need to test it as you go along. And so, well, I've got this unbolted because I was just looking at how I was gonna, you know, wire up these new pots and I was measuring some stuff, but I'm gonna bolt these back down. I'm gonna power the amp up. And then before we put the tubes in it and power them up, we're gonna do a quick voltage test just to make sure that everything is working as it should. And we're gonna check the grid voltage just to make sure we've got negative voltage on these grids before we put the tubes in and power it up. So you see we got our ground lead clipped here and we're going to do all this work measuring with one hand behind my back with just one hand with the probe. If you're tentative at all use some sort of a little wire clip so you have no hands in the amp and just power it on and off and move the test point around. So let's go ahead and power this guy up. And we're gonna look for voltage here. As you can see, with no tubes in the amp, there's 500 volts. And that's before the choke. And that's after the choke. So that all looks good. Now let's just double check that we've got voltage going to the grids of the tubes. And there's negative 55. 
negative 56. We'll switch around over here to the other side of the amp. Negative 56. Negative 56. So we've got our negative bias going to the grids of the output tubes. We've got our B plus, so all that seems to be working right. Now, before I put the bottom on the amp or take it upstairs to listen to it, I'm going to put the output tubes in, turn the amp on its side, and I'm going to check the voltages on each of these resistors. And 0.4 volts is what we're looking for, and that would be 40 milliamps of current going through the tube. Once we make sure all that's working right, we'll take the amp upstairs, hook the speakers up, hook an input up to it, make sure everything's working like it's supposed to, and then we'll continue on with our repairs and upgrades. First step is do this little power supply update or upgrade and remove the headphone jack wiring, wire the speaker jacks up straight to the output transformer or the ground for the speaker to the output transformer, and then go test it and make sure everything works. And this is a great place to wrap up this video. So you can see from that voltage testing that it really is hammering those 450 volt rated caps, leaving this amp the way it is. And until the tubes start drawing current, it's gonna hit 500 volts, which I'm not comfortable with. I haven't seen these things pop those caps. And so, hey, maybe they can live with that much for a short period of time. I still like having caps that are rated way below their running voltage. And then I also like seeing them rated at 105C if possible inside of a tube amp from all the heat that these things can generate. So I think it's a worthwhile upgrade. I also think getting rid of this headphone jack wiring makes sense because who's going to use a 45 watt push-pull KT88 amp with all this heat and everything to just listen to headphones? I mean, if you're a headphone user, get some sort of a headphone amp like that little Sparkos guy I reviewed and don't be using, you know, this giant amp with all this power use to drive a pair of headphones. So I think that's a good upgrade to get rid of that wiring and we're going to get into working on the pots and some other issues that this amp has in the next segment so hope you're enjoying this content if you are please subscribe please like the video thanks to all you patreon supporters and you regular viewers and we'll see you for the next video have a nice day